Last year in December, I attended the One Billion Summit and I came across so many different content creators from different parts of the world doing some amazing stuff I wouldn't have known of otherwise. And one such person I met was Farhana Ismail, a teen confidence coach. And how ironic is it that being a mother to teens myself, I hadn't heard of this expertise. I had spoken to mental health advocates, to psychologists, to trauma survivors, but and I always thought it all came under the umbrella of mental health. So today on the podcast, I have Farhana Ismail with me, helping me and parents to teenagers like myself understand and untangle this complex phase called teenage. Thank you so much for joining me on Chat Me Up with Tauhi Farhana. I am super excited to have this conversation with you today. Thank you, Tohida. It's such a pleasure to be on here with you, bringing light to this amazing, uh, you know, amazing niche that I work in because not many people like you are aware of it. Mm -hmm. So I'm really excited to be on here today. So before we, you know, dive in, give us a brief introduction. What exactly is it that you do? What exactly is a teen confidence coach? So as the name suggests, one of the things I work with primarily is obviously confidence. But what people mm -hmm. don't realize is, you know, when when we're working with anyone, whether it's an adult, whether it's a teen or a young adult, whatever it is, that everything starts with the mind. And coaching is, which is what I am, I'm, I'm a coach where I guide young people, teens and young adults, mm -hmm. to become more conf confident. And while we do that, we also build life skills that they take away with them to become happy and independent adults. Mm -hmm. A lot of what I do starts with self-awareness because whether that's confidence, whether you have a challenge in another area of life with communication with your friends, you know, sometimes I have people coming with, you know, the beginning of an eating disorder, whatever it may be, everything starts with how you look and perceive yourself and how you, how you see others perceiving you and you take that on board. And of course that affects you and your mm -hmm. confidence and everything else. Now what I do is I am in no way a, a counselor or a psychologist, but mm -hmm. I focus on well-being. I focus on the, the teens becoming aware of these issues so that it doesn't escalate into a case where they need to go to a therapy, go to therapy or, um, or to a counselor because they already know how to use the uh, use the tools for themselves because that's what I teach and that's what I work on with them mm -hmm. so uh, like before we go any further I like I said I, I met people from across the world mm. and uh, definitely you you come from Malawi Africa mm -hmm. so how was your childhood growing up like and is that something that led you to doing what you do today how was it growing up like you say teen like let's talk about your childhood and your teenage years so one of the biggest impacts on my on me as a person as me as who I am today is is my childhood I mean it's mm -hmm. everybody's childhood yeah. you know, it's not just myself mm -hmm. I grew up in Malawi which is a, a small country it's very beautiful it's peaceful but you know the cost of growing up in any way that's small and beautiful there, there is always a hidden cost and one of the costs was safety mm -hmm. so when I was about 12 years old I was the victim of an armed robbery. So it's uh, in Africa. In Africa. So <laughs> I don't want oh. it to take away from anyone visiting Africa because it doesn't happen too often. Mm -hmm. But um, in Malawi, um, my parents were away because, you know, Malawi doesn't have the best medical facilities. So my mm -hmm. parents were abroad and my brother and I were alone at home. And we had... just, to, just to stop you there, just to break, how did you reach in Malawi? Because you, like, you don't look uh, so native. So I'm, uh, my great-grandparents migrated, migrated okay, a long time ago. <laughs> a long time ago. So you connect to, like, as a, as a native Malawi. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess for me particularly, it's, uh, it's very difficult to belong at a, in a certain place mm -hmm. because, uh, I'm a third generation Indian, but when I go to India, I don't really fit in. And in Malawi, as you can see, I, I'm not a typical looking African, African, yes. right? So it feels like home. So I do associate with it. But you stand out. Yes. I mean, yeah. 
because of the majority of yeah of, of the population mm-hmm. so f- for me at the moment i think home very much is where you make it absolutely yes so we all migrate and you mm-hmm. know you make your home where you are where you're fa- with family mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yeah so you were saying you were so you were at home yeah when this happened and we had it was a normal tuesday night and in walking well actually i was doing my school homework so i still remember this and mm-hmm. luckily i was in the same room as my brother we were both in the same room and in walks in this man at first it was just one man and so you was, didn't hear them enter no because oh. our house is quite uh, large oh, okay. so what happens in the kitchen you can't often hear in, in the, the bedroom room. okay yeah so they walked in he was holding a gun at that moment uh, i kind of thought hmm, maybe the guards found a gun in the garden or something I, oh, okay. you know you but have you this, still weren't coming around yeah yeah it yes it was a bit of a shock yeah in that moment understandably so of course yeah so um my my brother stood up and uh, he stood in front of me okay and uh, how old was your brother at that time you were 12 uh yeah he was about 20 21 oh, so okay. he's old enough to yeah uh, protect you yeah basically and he did he very much did but um we had 20 25 people in our house we didn't oh, they we, came in a gang they came in a gang gang oh and uh yeah it was i have to say very traumatizing um, scary because we didn't know if we were going to make it we were very fortunate because they didn't touch us uh-huh. uh unfortunately people who experienced the same thing in the following weeks were not so lucky so oh. we were very blessed we were very fortunate but at the same time when you're growing up and you're that young you it changes you you know um you learn how to be a victim because hey mm-hmm. you've been put in, you know this situation has been imposed on you so they just robbed your house and left Yes, but uh, yeah, okay. But they had Thank guns. Small mercies. Yeah, they had um they were carrying an AK47. So wow. They did cock that a few times. So we were like it was oh. quite scary, yes. Um it took me about 6 months to to sleep on my own again because when my parents came, of course, uh no one wanted to sleep on their own. <laughs> <laughs> At that point, especially me. Yeah. But it took me years to feel safe in my own home of course and uh, it left me feeling a bit resentful towards the country i grew up in mm-hmm. to the home i grew up in it, uh, so there was a lot of feelings there mm-hmm. that and i never explored them because i always thought i was a strong person mm-hmm. little did i realize that it would keep me stuck later on in my life and uh, the other one of the other big impacts on my life was um when i was um about 15 uh i lost my sister uh she, not in malawi mm-hmm. she used mm-hmm. to live uh, abroad but um sorry to hear that it's uh it was part of my life experience and i was very grateful for all the times i did spend with her but at the same time it again left its mark mm-hmm. i wasn't the most confident of teens i I would say I was in my own world. I was a type mm-hmm. of person who was lost in the world of books. Mm-hmm. I mean there's no you know at least it wasn't anything harmful but at the same time I was in another world. I wasn't really living in the world as I could have been. Mm-hmm. So, you know, even though I had a few friends at school, I didn't really reveal myself. and i was quite you were quiet holding back. yes i was yeah. holding back i was numb uh, i would say my heart was almost frozen mm-hmm. and you know later on when uh, when i went to university i did have a great time i was very fortunate i actually came to university in dubai so that was okay. my first uh, so probably counter. that explains how you got to dubai yes definitely ah, okay and uh, again i wasn't fully myself mm-hmm. and then later on i i was working in communications so i was working with an ngo and then Again, i was a teacher did, did you go back yes i went back home mm-hmm. uh and i was a teacher for a few years so okay. i had great opportunity to interact with teens and young adults mm-hmm. and tweens too so i had uh, um, advantage the advantage of being able to connect with many many teens mm-hmm. and tweens 
and I realized that I was still stuck. And that when I... Uh, is that when you realized this is why you were not able to unwind and connect with people? Yes, uh, I started to realize... Probably seeing more teenagers engage more freely. Yes. Yeah. But at the same time, I also started to realize that I kept running from things. Like, even though I was always choosing careers where I was giving back, mm-hmm. it never left me satisfied. Mm-hmm. I was always looking for the next thing, the mm-hmm. next challenge, the next opportunity, because I was not at peace. Mm-hmm. It had nothing to do with what I was doing. It was me. So when you finished uh, school and you came here for uni, mm-hmm. uh, how did you choose to go back? Because you want you had that sense of giving back? or You know... Because, you know, uh, like, I live in India. Yeah. Like, I'm an Indian, but yes. I've lived the majority of my life. Yes. Here, and I know how it is to live in, uh, like, a developing country. Mm. So recently, uh, we went to Kenya mm. to go back to... Uh, yeah, experience in Africa so when we went to Kenya I had a lot of people telling me don't go out you know stay indoors it's not safe to like we had to land in Nairobi so we were headed to Masai Mara so people told us not to leave the hotel just stay inside and when I went out like we just took a stroll like we just took a drive around the city and it felt very much like India the kind of safety the infrastructure everything was similar but what I guess a lot of people because all of these reviews that I read were online but I think that all comes from a space of having lived here you know, the sense of security, the safety this yes. country gives us, Dubai gives us, we won't find it anywhere else. Like, even in the like the most popular countries, like even in the US, you don't feel as safe as you would feel here, right? So, but then having lived in Africa and then come here, experienced your uni here, the safety and the security, you still chose to go back. I have... Because I've heard a lot of people, once they come here, the whole plan would be, okay, I'm going to make my money and leave in five, in five years. Yes. But nobody ends up going back they all just love this place so much the convenience the luxury and the ease of life in general nobody really wants to go back so what took you back you know like i said you know when you lose somebody Mm. the toll is felt not only by one person it's felt by the entire family absolutely and of course the biggest toll was for my parents you know Mm -hmm. uh they say there's all types of grief but the 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 deepest grief is when you lose your own child yeah and uh, I wouldn't want anyone to see that Mm -hmm. Uh, but uh, of course on my parents that was in the beginning though my parents were really protective over me because Mm -hmm. I was the youngest of course and uh, you know they'd already lost a daughter so for me to send me to university was a big big step step you know mm-hmm. and to be able to do that for them was was very difficult but they did but the deal was that i would go back mm-hmm. so okay. i was living up to my part of the deal okay would i say in that moment when i had to make that decision well the decision was already made and mm-hmm. I, I went back was mm-hmm. i happy about it Oh, yeah. not so much okay if given a choice you would have chosen to probably yes and mm-hmm. uh, what made it even worse was um when i went back in about what was it um when i went back like a year or so later we went through another armed robbery oh because in the same home <laughs> in the same home so oh, of course that's um that's bad yeah so in that moment of course i was not very um happy uh, happy to be home but i again built a life for myself I made mm-hmm. some I, I made some great friends because now I was a little bit different mm-hmm. but you know just uh, I have to admit that you coming out of two armed robberies on scats that is something yes <laughs> yes yeah alhamdulillah yeah yeah mm-hmm. so you know those blessings yeah. <laughs> you would be grateful for them alhamdulillah definitely but um, but I needed to be there mm-hmm. because I wouldn't have had the experiences I had that I did when I was there so I was very lucky so as soon as I got to Malawi it was a struggle to find a job because Mm -hmm. I was in public relations and you know Malawi it was still an up and coming field Mm -hmm. still is yes Mm -hmm. so but it took me a while but when I got a job I was automatically on the senior management team and okay uh, that's quite uh, a a jump from a starter to a senior management team. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. So, and I was the communications officer for uh, for an NGO there called Mary's mm-hmm. Meals. So it's a Scottish NGO. I still have very fond memories of my time with them. 
it was uh, yeah the kind of opportunities I wouldn't possibly have gotten in my first mm-hmm. couple of years here. Yeah, I mean, I I was I got to do some amazing things like you know I I got to host An- Annie Lennox when she came to Malawi mm-hmm. and you know we had the BBC come and we had these Scottish MPs. Good exposure for you. It's good exposure and definitely helped me grow as a person. Mm-hmm. And little did I know that the little amount of communication I did would be so helpful to me today. And it was a skill that I built. So, oh, okay. Yeah, definitely. So like looking at your job, job expanse, mm. you said you worked in an NGO, you worked for the government, you said you worked for corporate, you worked in schools for primary to secondary. Uh, you also dabbled a bit in mental well m- sorry mental he- uh, health for women mm. and then finally this yes. so like you were saying all along like you know doing all that you've done at such a young age were you at some level trying to make peace with the trauma that you've had you had had you know i never felt like i was enough you and, okay uh, throughout all these jobs that is yes you know mm-hmm. i um i used to say well i haven't really done anything you know i'm you were never satisfied with what you were doing yeah I, I, did, I couldn't I couldn't see the value in it mm-hmm. but um, yeah I, I felt um, years later when I started my you know when I was teaching and I started my personal development journey and I started going to uh, a, you know a lot of seminars and I actually got a coach myself that helped change me me and I didn't realize what I was really holding on to mm-hmm. and why did you get a coach because you want you were seeking help yeah because uh-huh. I was I was I was stuck you know I was in mm-hmm. so much uh, or so much pain and the, what I didn't realize until years later I, I always thought the pain was well I've lost my sibling and I was very close to her you know mm-hmm. um, she was uh, older than I was so she was almost like uh, a mother figure too but uh-huh. like a cool hip you know mm-hmm. But um, what I didn't realize was I was holding on to guilt. Guilt. Yes. Um, I always, you know, when, before my sister passed away, she, she'd asked me to go and see her. Mm-hmm. I was in Malawi at the time. My parents were there. And she was in? She was in the UK. Okay. Uh, my parents were with her and I was oh. in Malawi. So and your parents were in the UK with yes, her? Yes, mm-hmm. yeah. And... Um, I said, no, I can't come. I have exams because I was in the process of, you know, studying for my GCSEs. Oh. And uh, I didn't realize that, you know, there was yeah. anything serious or yeah. anything to worry about, right? Yeah. Nobody expects yes, the worst, no, course, And it was sure. very sudden for us. Yeah. So I said no. And, and you hold on to that guilt? I held on to that. Not I didn't realize I held on to it, but I held on to the fact that I deliberately took away the chance of of my last time seeing her. So, and I didn't realize that until a few years ago, actually, not even like 2019. You know, if you look at it in the larger scheme of things, you yeah. know, just saying no because you had other priorities. Yes. Okay, that age of yours, you yes. said you were 15. Yes. Probably doing your boards or closer to your boards. Yeah. When you say a no, it is for a valid reason, right? Yeah, yeah. But to imagine after like all these years, to go back to that guilt that you wouldn't have even known existed mm. if not for your therapy or the coaching that you went through yes and uh, the little things that the mind holds on to subconsciously is so tricky for us to even understand that's exactly it and it leaves you stuck but yeah. it wasn't now i look at it as an adult i was like of course it, it's not something to hold on to because exactly you're you're a child but when you're when you're 13 14 15 16 17 our minds hold on to things mm-hmm. and and it stores it oh, sorry. it stores it in your subconscious yeah so you would have thought like you felt guilty because you bullied or you were bullied or yes. like, you know, these are the typical things that we would assume happens to teenagers mm. like because it's in the middle school but to hold on to the guilt that you were uh, i think you know it 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 worries me like you know you don't never know what your subconscious mind is actually telling you to do wow that's exactly it and that's why we have to be aware mm. of of these things and and you know when uh, when so how did you come to terms with it how did i come to terms with it well i did a few you know coaching sessions where we talked about it mm-hmm. but um there was a lot of catharsis for me because i went to a few tony robbins events 
mm-hmm. and uh, you know he really gets you out of your comfort zone you know walking on fire or whatever it was but it was actually when I did Date with Destiny I Date with Destiny is uh, one of Tony Robbins events right mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. Um, it's a like five day event it's quite intense but the first two days just because of what they talk about and you know they take you through your own personal journey that sort of thing mm-hmm. I was in tears for, for 48 hours literally I did not stop crying I have never cried so much in my life and it was it was it was healing because mm-hmm. I was talking about these things I was becoming aware of what I'd been holding on to and I forgave myself for saying no yeah and understanding that I am human mm-hmm. we are all human mm-hmm. it makes us think about the decisions we make coming onward so like mm-hmm. my one of my biggest values is family mm-hmm. and I think one of the the the, th- the thing is when you're when you know this at the same time you also have you know your priority is family but at the same time it can you also have to set boundaries with that Mm -hmm. so that's also been a growth Mm -hmm. you know so it's it it all comes to play together you know we as humans can make our lives so complicated that's so true (laughs) (laughs) we make it complex for ourselves Mm -hmm. but i think that would happen uh, more so in the adult age yes because you're bound by so many uh um what I say priorities by the society like you have your family you have your husband you have your kids who do you like you know especially like coming like you know from an, I don't know, like uh, a patriarchal society mm. these are things that you would ideally want to cater to which alhamdulillah we're able to break out of now anyways so, uh, yeah. no that's very true but you'd be surprised the teens nowadays mm-hmm. they're also juggling so many different things like they want to do well at school mm-hmm. but they want to have fun yeah they you know they they need to be popular mm-hmm. they want to try new things but the fear of rejection you know the fear mm-hmm. of missing out missing out mm-hmm. so they, there's so much they're dealing with mm-hmm. and social media does not make it easy so tell me farhana when and how like you know for parents like like i said mm-hmm. i'm a mother to teenagers myself so for me and for parents like me to know when and why would you know someone approach should someone approach a teen confidence coach so often uh, what i'm finding is people always approach me when the teen or tween or young adult has an issue Mm -hmm. which is fair enough you know Mm -hmm. we can resolve the issue whether that's confidence whether that's relationship issues whether that's deciding what subjects to do for Mm -hmm. a levels or or university uh, what career to go into after Mm -hmm. university because even though you do your degree there's so many options available Yeah, or the uh, options keep multiplying yes every year. Uh, and uh, say you move to a new country and you uh-huh. don't have uh, you know your teen is finding it difficult because it's a struggle mixing in a new school you know we we talk about a variety of these things mm-hmm. um, body image is a is a big one but I also have clients whose parents realize that actually it's nice for them to have somebody to talk to and guide uh, you know somebody who's a mentor who can they can bring anything to the table where there won't be no judgment no bias I'm not a parent mm-hmm. so I'm not there to give them rules or mm-hmm. anything like that but I'm there to ask them really interesting or insightful questions that will get them thinking and they along with it they'll take away tools that they can use for the rest of their lives for example what do you mean by tools tools like we'll do an audit yeah mm-hmm. uh where are you in your life? Where do you want to go? We, we learn how to set goals. Mm-hmm. We learn how to build habits. Mm-hmm. Uh, we learn how to, what are your values? Okay. Uh, sometimes there's uh, tools for confidence, tools, specific tools for body image, whatever, or techniques, whatever comes in. And I'm also mm-hmm. NLP, an, an NLP practitioner. So I bring in my NLP training too and my NLP mm-hmm. skills and techniques that, that are really powerful because they change neural pathways in your brain. Mm-hmm. So we repattern how they're thinking and those limiting self beliefs. I wish I'd had that when I was sixteen or seventeen, because our limiting beliefs we carry throughout, mm-hmm. and it's it's almost harder to wipe them away when you're older, older mm-hmm. because you're set now. Mm-hmm. So you think because you identified this uh, in your life so much later. Mm. 
you want to do that for the teens mm, for going exactly through anything it. similar so uh, like obviously we've all passed through that phase what i'm like what i'm trying to understand is you know making decisions making mistakes mm. okay let's start with making mistakes at teen, uh, uh, in the teenage years uh and then trying to make up for it like you know making decisions that are beneficial to them and all of these things why is having a a coach like yourself like you know going to help it because you know like uh, on a completely you know because I, i haven't heard i hadn't heard of like like i was telling mm-hmm. i hadn't heard of what you do so i'm i'm just trying to understand like you know if you give them constant guidance does it hamper the teen, like the teens ability to make decisions for themselves which the, like you know because we've all gone through that phase we are resilient we've come out of it alhamdulillah like i know it, it does not apply to everyone oh. but then to understand that you know if it is going to hamper their ability going forward their decision making their judgments and because they have their friends to confide in so isn't it a part of their growth process i i would say there's nothing wrong with having your friends and confiding in your friends mm-hmm. and but, to make decisions on your own because it's a part of the process yes but to have someone constantly guiding you like you said mm-hmm. there's a difference between somebody asking you the right questions mm-hmm. to help you make the decisions than g- making the decision for you so for example when you have a friend mm-hmm. does your friend really listen or does your friend listen to answer listen to answer mm-hmm. interesting listen or listen listening to answer when you're a parent Are you going to give them something that's going to suit you and your parental values or is it going to be a decision based on their growth or learning in that moment? Mm-hmm. So that is what you apply. So so when when I'm t- t- talking to to my teen I'll be like okay let, let's look at the situation. What do you think you'll get out of it. Mm-hmm. Or you know if you have a conflict with a friend, what is this friend giving you? Mm-hmm. What is the part you are playing? Mm-hmm. What do we need to do with this friend? This it's an open conversation. It's an open conversation. Mm-hmm. It's not do this, do this, do this. Mm-hmm. So you're saying uh when they confide in parents, okay, now let's uh okay, let's keep the friends aside mm-hmm. like you said because it could be listening or listening to give you uh, just a random answer but when you talk about your friends or when you talk about like okay outside of their educational quality because we have certain expectations from our kids right so but then when we when they come and talk to us about their friends or about different things other than education in their lives won't the advice from a parent also come from a good place definitely but when mm-hmm. parents always have uh, you know the and best intentions at heart yes One thing we have to remember is parents are from now a different generation. Mm-hmm. When you were your age, did everything your parents said come across? Yeah. How did it come across, right? Yeah, right. yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, I I heard a a beautiful quote this morning and it said you will only understand or realize your parents are right when your children tell you the day your children tell you you're wrong. <laughs> so so <laughs> how long do we wait for that? Yeah. That's the thing, right? Mm-hmm. How, do you realize uh, are you at the point where you realize your parents are right? In a lot of ways. I, like I, I wouldn't question everything, but yeah, in a lot of ways we it could have been so much more different, of course. Yeah. I mean, I know I I don't have kids yet, but mm-hmm. um I hear my some of the things my parents have said to me over the years. I look back at it and I go, oh, just listened. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So it's uh but it's part of the process, you know. Mm-hmm. You do you when your do parents listen, are yeah. saying something to you. It's a part of that especially in teens. Yeah. It's a very integral part to actually defy and you know have your own opinion on a lot of things That's which I which I see a lot in this age current generation. And you know, I built a, a I'm really grateful that I built a rapport with my the teens I work with mm-hmm. because I come from a place of experience but I still come across as very young. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So as a result of that I connect to them very quickly. Mm-hmm. But the parents are, are almost reassured because now they know that there's somebody 
who's had experience with life mm -hmm. to an extent. Of yeah. course, I, I'm always going to build more and more. Mm -hmm. But uh, so it's not like uh, the guidance or the the conversations are mm -hmm. going to be against safety or mm -hmm. yeah, anything. absolutely. Yeah. So the guidance will be with the right intention, of course. Yes. So, but you know, like any examples without taking names that you could you know put out for us to understand like what is it that kids actually seek help with more often so i had a teen a few, um, recently who she she came to me because she was at a really low point in her life because mm -hmm. you know she grew up in a small town mm -hmm. and uh you know, when you grow up in small towns, friends are limited. You, it's not like you can mm -hmm. easily make new friends. Mm -hmm. And she'd lost her best friends that she'd grown up with, like for years. Mm -hmm. They had a disagreement. Okay. And she had, she was just feeling really down. She was, she lost her sense of confidence, her sense of self worth. She was just in the lowest possible place. And uh, it was affecting everything around her because she was getting ready to move forward from school and mm -hmm. you know she was holding on to these things and she just couldn't let go mm -hmm. you know we had a few conversations uh, you know actually the very first conversation I had with her and I spoke to her the following week and she was she, she said to herself that she felt so much better she was so much lighter mm -hmm. and just to confide she knew and then we talked about how to deal with the friends that were still at school mm -hmm. and what to do because often we're, we're stuck in, a, in sometimes we're stuck in, in this box about even what kind of friends we want mm -hmm. or what is a friend yeah you you don't actually know what you really want from yeah. a friend or we what. have a checklist but like not necessarily the all tick yes when we you know set yeah. out to make a friend make that friend but also we often don't think what are we bringing to a mm -hmm. relationship yeah we always think about what are they doing for us mm -hmm. or what are, what are they not doing most pro most mm -hmm. often than anything else? But we never think about what do we bring? Mm -hmm. What kind of friend are we going to show up as? Yeah. Whether we yeah. meet the person for an hour. Yeah, it's all what we want. That's it. Yeah. So you're changing the perspective. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, we talked about our values and, uh, you know, we, we b brought in some confidence strategies. A and now... <laughs> It's really hard to get hold of her because now mm -hmm. she's she's social butterfly. She's a social butterfly. <laughs> she's busy all the time, and uh -huh. it's it's great. Like mm -hmm. I'm not there forever. Mm -hmm. My role is to teach you the okay. skills, mm -hmm. so you can go away and make those decisions as you need them. Okay, now it makes sense. Yeah. Yes, it's not to have not to be in their lives constantly. No. So you give them that guidance yes. to make the right decisions mm. to help them. You know, sort it in their heads yes. so that going forward it helps them. And, and sometimes I have students that stay for the whole year or mm -hmm. even like during the school year because there's so much happening during the school year. Mm -hmm. So, you know, even if it's like a 30 minute session once a week. Uh -huh. So ideally how long, uh, like in terms of time or in like, a, uh, how long does it take to actually make a difference? How many sessions or like how many months? So normally with all my clients, I say at least two, three months, uh -huh. you know, to see an, a difference. Mm -hmm. But, you know, with some people, it could even be a month. You mm -hmm. just don't know. Mm -hmm. With When you're working with people and everybody has a different issue, mm -hmm. you can't really put a time to it. You know, you have to say, how much are you willing to put in? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And how much are you carrying? Yeah. If somebody is carrying stuff for 24 years... It's difficult to let go. It takes time. Yeah, it's not going to take three months even. Yeah. You know, it mm -hmm. might, but... I, you know what I've been carrying stuff for so many years and I still haven't let it all go mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm still a work in progress uh, you know I may I have moments where I get a coach and then I may leave them for a little bit but I'll go back mm -hmm. or I'll go to another whatever it is you know mm -hmm. I'll find different ways to keep healing because mm -hmm. healing is not healing a one time pill that you take it's a process. It's a it's work in progress. It's almost a lifetime even. Mm -hmm. Because you're always going to be working on something. We're human. Mm. Something always comes up. Yeah. Also, like, you know, in this age, especially for teenagers, mm. you know, there's so much conflict in terms of, you know, they're, they're so exposed to social media. They're so exposed to everything that's happening around the world. On one side, there's a lot of grief, misery, war. And on the other end versus, you know, the glamour, the shallowness and all, like 
all of it so i i what i see in my kids is also that they are a little confused like you know should they do that should they give to the community that's struggling or should they be part of the community that's you know doing so well so i think a lot of it adds on to the pressure that the pressure that the kids are already in in terms of the peers and you know the teenage hormonal rush and all of that it's it, i think it's a complex stage and uh, the cu- current in the surroundings or the current lives that the kids are in it doesn't really help in making it easier any easier for them and it's not only the kids you know uh, think about the adults you know yeah. the glamour or the or should we be true to our values and mm. you know what do we want yeah so also now like you were saying now you're a third generation kids they're going for all the kids of global yes so it's very difficult for them to hold on to their values their culture the tradition mm. i find it's so difficult you know because they they grew up in a multicultural society especially in a place like dubai it's yes. they come across different cultures and it's it's difficult and it's also challenging for them to stay true to who they are their values and the cultural traditions that we bring definitely but by values i mean things like for example if integrity is a value are yeah, you living no, by yeah, that? that that's one question yeah. yes yeah uh, honesty um uh, kindness mm mm-hmm. and then they have to keep asking themselves because we all forget to are mm-hmm. we living by that value mm-hmm. was i really kind in that moment yeah and uh, that's if they have that anything that comes at them mm mm-hmm. they'll have the boundaries they'll have the resistance mm-hmm. the persistence to get through that mm mm-hmm. but if that is not taught then how how will they know mm-hmm. if they don't know how to become confident mm-hmm. how will they know for example if it's confidence you know a lot of times i work with uh, um students who have confidence issues mm-hmm. you break it down where are you now mm-hmm. yeah what is one small step you can take to become more confident whether that's putting your hand up in class mm-hmm. and then you test it how many times am i going to put my hands up in class mm-hmm. i'm going to put my hand up once a day Mm-hmm. in the beginning mm-hmm. i'm going to put it up twice a day uh i'm going to ask a question mm-hmm. you know i want to now i'm going to do a class presentation mm-hmm. now i'm going to be a class leader it's a step by step process but if they're doing it by themselves how are they going to do it mm-hmm. so it's not only about de- decisions you see it's mm-hmm. about actually guiding them so that later on pushing them yeah and motivating them so later on when they get a job they'll be like hey i want to be part of this team project mm-hmm. i want to put my hand up for this i want to lead it eventually mm-hmm. yeah, because that's how you build the skill now mm-hmm. if no i don't know about you but i never learned that in school mm-hmm. yes so that's where your role comes in mm. so uh before like you know so now that you listen to a lot of woes and you all these you know different struggles of kids and you're constantly motivating them how do you unwind how do you like go off all of this at the end of the day i well everything for me starts at the beginning of the day i like to get all my self care in at the start so mm-hmm. especially because you know what it has been like yeah. so and again you're getting into the same routine of listening to others words mm-hmm. so basically i start my day with you know meditation and and then mm-hmm. pray and then um you know i always work out have something healthy for breakfast and then you know depending on the time i leave i either try to journal in the morning or the evening mm-hmm. whichever one works for me that particular day and i always listen I'm to like journaling always helps yeah it does it it's did. really cathartic and when you read it back you kind of realize what thoughts you've had mm-hmm. and there's negative thoughts you know mm-hmm. if you don't hold them and if you don't manage them they manage you mm-hmm. so yeah to actually put it put it down on paper mm. and it gives you a release rather than just piling it up inside definitely mm-hmm. i definitely advocate for it and I, and i try and get my my clients to do it i mean be some of them i'll start them even very small and say write down three three things you're grateful for mm-hmm. it just yeah builds that uh, sense of gratitude when when you're grateful mm-hmm. you can't you don't have you don't have the energy or the space to think anything else mm-hmm. so f- what are your five top red flags that parents should watch out for in their teenagers i normally do a quick a quick fire S- session but this is what i want to know from you so it depends what you're looking for right mm-hmm. for example if they're so, procrastinating but, no, uh, uh, 
a general you know uh five general red flag that like not necessarily pertaining to anything but something that we should be as parents aware of so for anything for example if your if your teen is starting to spend too much time on their own and it wasn't something that happened before mm-hmm. you see them procrastinating okay like you know if they projects work whatever it is it's not being done and it was never an issue before mm-hmm. there's something there what else can you look out for you know if they're if they're more snappy than usual if they're giving you a lot of attitude and you would just think it's teenage hormones mm-hmm. or something but that's that's how i tend to rub it off but no but it might you know there might be something there you know they mm-hmm. they might not be going through something that they're not sharing with you you know if they're because there's so many different things you can deal with it's if they really don't want to try mm-hmm. like you know they just there's just there, there's something there's a block there like they just whatever you do whatever you say mm-hmm. nothing is going there, there is something happening whether it seems like it or not yeah mm-hmm. we have to remember that teenagers it's a very fine line because we have to remember that teenagers are teenagers at the end of the day yeah mm-hmm. that's how a lot of parents tend to yes. classify um, yeah. you know yeah when you're a teenager in time there's a, some attitude yeah. yeah there's a there's times when you want to be on your own mm-hmm. there is times when you don't want to share because you have your tribe but you know if you know your child mm-hmm. which most parents like really know their child <laughs> yes as soon like as something so. <laughs> yeah so as soon as something is off off mm-hmm. you can tell and sometimes if they like one of the signs is if they really don't want to go to school mm-hmm. something's happening mm-hmm. of course either they 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 they're scared of something <coughs> they have the fear of something that's happening there or maybe there's bullying or maybe they mm-hmm. they just don't feel safe mm-hmm. so just be aware of these things and even if it's even if there isn't a red flag mm-hmm. honestly i i advocate coaching for everyone as adults too because it just really has such an impact it when you when you're trying to get something done or when you want to outcome or when you want to learn a new tool or technique it just 10x as everything mm-hmm. it's easier and even when you want to have a better relationship with your teen or or you know the or you struggle with communicating with them mm-hmm. as soon as they talk to somebody who shows them a different perspective mm-hmm. they start to see their parents differently too in a good way in a good way mm-hmm. and uh, and the aim of course is always to leave them to grow up to ha- be happy independent successful adults that uh, are happy mm-hmm. because people think pain is is normal and i'm not saying that there aren't difficult things that happen in life mm-hmm. i'm not saying that we don't all experience pain at some point but it's not a daily mm-hmm. problem that mm-hmm. has to be there yeah. you live with joy yeah you don't have to live daily with pain right. that's it yeah an occasional bout of pain is is agreed yeah is that so what are your major pointers for teenagers that you know that some major pointers that teenagers have to work for on themselves work on themselves so how do you feel about yourself mhm what are your thoughts that you're thinking because those thoughts are affecting everything you do mhm okay especially if they're not controlled how does one control their thought so there's a variety of techniques that you can mm-hmm. use but one i'd say is is you can it depends what kind of person if you are if you're a visual person what i'd do is i'd make the thought bigger in your head mm-hmm. and make it in a different color like you can actually make it neon bright neon yellow oh. whatever that is okay. in your brain okay that is if you're a visual person yes mm-hmm. and uh it almost becomes ridiculous because now you're seeing this big thought in front of you and you're like <laughs> i'm trying to visualize something okay so yeah. mm-hmm. um another one is you can try this one have you got a negative thought in your head at the moment no 
Okay. Well, do you have one that you have co- uh, often? Not that I can think of now at the top of my head, no. Okay. So when you do have one, for example, yeah. I just am such a failure. Right? That's a thought. Okay, that's a thought. Okay. I, um, mm. Right? That's a negative thought. People have that yeah, often. That's a thought, yeah. I think a lot of people, including me, go to, okay, I'm not, I've not done this enough. Yeah, I could yeah. have done it better. Yes. Yeah. What I want you to do now is, you know, Bugs Bunny or any cartoon voice. Mm, mm-hmm. I want you to say that to yourself in your head in, a, in, a, in that voice. Mm-hmm. In the most funny voice that you can. Mm-hmm. What happens to the thought when you say it like that? Mm. It sounds funny. It sounds funny. Sounds ridiculous. Yeah. Do you you don't have any value for it anymore, mm-hmm. right? Because mm-hmm. it's like, hey, that's just ridiculous. Mm-hmm. And Interesting. Yeah. And another thing you can do is say, hey, thank you, mind, thank you. I don't need to hear that. That's not true. Okay. Or be quiet. Like, mm-hmm. I'm in control here. Mm-hmm. That's just one of the things that uh, mm-hmm. you can be aware of. To control oh, your thoughts. To control yeah. your thoughts. But there's so many other techniques that mm-hmm. I work with, with my yeah. teens. Mm-hmm. But uh, what else? Oh, yes. Not everything on social media is real. Mm. And be aware of your values. What is it that you are important? What are, What is important to you? And are you living by them? Mm-hmm. Because that will help every decision you make. Mm-hmm. And, you know, your friends may tell you to do something, but is it going with your values? Mm -hmm. And how long will the glory last in that moment? Yeah, I think that's very important for the kids to understand how long the glory will last if you do something unto it. And what will be the consequences Mm -hmm. in the long run? If it's worth the consequence, you know. So thank you so much for this insightful conversation, Farhana. It was absolutely lovely talking to you. And it's great to know that you have all the ammunition set for, to be a great parent yourself, inshallah. I wish you so much success in your career and in your life going forward. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you so much. It's been a true pleasure. And uh, thank you for inviting me on here. I really enjoyed the conversation with you. Thank you. And uh, Farhana has her own page on Instagram. Please consider following Teen Confidence Coach. He gives out some amazing uh, advices and tips on how to raise your kids. Thank you. Thank you.